Um, we're starting today a sermon series in um, the great book of Titus. Um, many more sermons than there are chapters, which is always a good thing. Garrett commented, me, commented to me over there this morning that he never realised there was so much in the little book of Titus. And I said, well, that's good. That's what I aim to do. Um, so much so, in fact, that as Lynn has noted, um, she was hopeful. She said a short passage, a short sermon. And I said, no, two short passages and two short sermons. <laughs> so we're going to do the introduction first, uh, a bit of background on Crete uh, and the letter, and then get into the first section. So let's pray before we do. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, I give you great thanks for your goodness to us, your gracious, merciful love for us in saving us, in making us your children. Heavenly Father, we pray that today that you might be speaking to us so that we can truly reflect who we are, who have been made um, by the death and resurrection of your Son. Help us to be reflecting your image. Uh, for Jesus' sake and for your glory. Amen. A pagan society, lying, deceiving, no belief in the one true God, self-indulgent, sexually promiscuous, violent men, emancipated women exploiting their freedoms to shirk off marriage in lieu of casual sex and worldly appetites. Yes, that's the background of the society for the Cretan church. But it could just as easily be modern-day Australia, couldn't it? And so the background for our church as well. The great danger for the churches in Crete was that they were being influenced by the world around them and it would only get worse if this wasn't stopped and reversed. And we would be extremely naive to think that the church in Australia, yes, even here in Narrabri, isn't being influenced by the society that we live in. Martin Luther said of the letter to Titus that it's a model of Christian doctrine in which is comprehended in a masterful way all that is necessary for a Christian to know and to live. That's a strong commendation for an often neglected book, isn't it? And I believe that Luther is right because this letter summarises the essence of the Christian life, particularly with a view to what the Christian community, the church, is to do and to be like. Indeed, I believe that the letter to Titus is a tract for our times. It's good that it's a short, a short letter. And the church today bears the marks of having neglected its message. Not our church as such, but the church in general, the worldwide church. Like the Cretan Christians, we face a serious question. How can we live as God's holy people in such a pagan world? Paul's short letter to Titus addresses this problem. Sometime after his third missionary journey and before his imprisonment in Rome where he was martyred, Paul visited Crete with Titus and left him there to help resolve some problems in the struggling churches and to help them get a foothold in that pagan culture. Paul announces himself as the writer of this letter in his greeting right at the start and as well as announcing himself and his qualifications to the Cretan church, because this letter was for the churches in Crete, not just for Titus. Paul was from the very start setting up the one true God as the complete opposite of the gods that were worshipped in Crete. Cretans believed the Greek gods were mere men and women that were elevated to gods through their benevolent service and good gifts to mankind. It was a theology that worked from below rather than from above. They believed that the majority of the gods were born on their island, including the chief man become god, Zeus, who was allegedly buried there. So not much of a god, I don't think. In their minds, Crete was the central place of the worship of the gods. And their mythology was so entrenched in Cretan culture that the churches in Paul's day were integrating their understanding of the Christian god with the prevailing views about the Greek gods mainly Zeus. And this was very bad news, especially in the light of the kind of man become God that Zeus was supposed to be. It's recorded that he loved to seduce women by any means necessary, even by assuming godlike characteristics in order to get what he wanted. 
In a nutshell, Zeus was a liar and a womaniser. And yet the Cretans immortalised him for this. They took pride in his shady character and his underhanded ways, much the same as today's society is calling evil good and good evil. Well, Paul set out to refute the idea that the Christian God was cast in the image of Zeus or any small g gods for that matter. He wanted to make it crystal clear that the God revealed in Jesus Christ is totally different from Zeus. And he brilliantly conveys that by contrasting the character of the three-in-one God to Zeus, the liar. First of all, in scene verse 2, that Paul goes after the idea that the true God could be a lying God. Paul says, In the hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised long ages ago. So he announces the hope of eternal life promised by a God who does not lie. Literally, it says, he is an unlying God. Zeus might well be a liar, but God will not lie because he cannot lie. Unlike Zeus, this God can be trusted to carry out his redemptive promises for the good of his people. Secondly, Paul upends the Cretan man-become-God theology by offering a profound God-became-one-of-us theology. He intentionally collides with the cultural myth by insisting that Jesus appeared among humans from above. He didn't ascend because of what he had done. It's a top-down theology insisting on Jesus' deity, his godness. Paul speaks of God, that is the Father, as God our Saviour, while at the same time speaking of Jesus, the incarnate Son of God, as Christ Jesus our Saviour and the great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ. It'll take a little bit of flipping, but you might be able to do it later. If you compare chapter 1, verse 3 and verse 4, and then chapter 2, verse 10, verse 13, and chapter 3, verse 4 and 6, you'll notice how closely Paul puts references to both Jesus and God as Saviour. The point is, if God the Father and Jesus the Son are both the same God and Saviour of the Cretans and of us, then Jesus is God. Not a God, he is the God. And unlike Zeus, he doesn't assume his deity for his own gain, for his own desires. Rather, though Jesus is God, he sets aside his divine privileges and glory and becomes a man, becomes one of us for our gain. And thirdly, though not in the introduction but later in the, in the book, he reverses the idea that the Cretan gods became that way by their good works and kindness. Most of the second and third chapters are exhortations to good works. Now, I didn't look in the, I think this is the pre-1984 NIV, the newer version, every, sub, every section heading in the recent NIV either has good or good works in every one of them. That's what Titus is about, being saved. I'm getting ahead of myself here. I better go back to the script. <clears throat> um, but contrary to the Cretans and so much of today's thought patterns, Christians aren't doing this to become God's children. We are doing it because we already are his children. We don't do good things and live good lives to get saved. We do them because we already are saved. We are God's children, bought at a great price into his family. We're Jesus' brothers and sisters, and that is how we should live. We are saved to serve, saved to do the good works that he has prepared in advance for us to do. So we live good lives and we do good things because of who we are and so that other people will give glory to the Father, not to us. The complete opposite of how the Cretans saw their gods and how they were living. No wonder the church was in trouble. So Paul announces himself as a servant, actually a slave. Paul does not begin the right reverend Dr. Paul, honourable apostle, author and Christian conference speaker. No, he says literally, Paul, a slave of God. 
He often refers to himself as a servant of Christ, but this is the only time he calls himself a servant of God. It was a title applied to Moses and other prophets, so perhaps he is identifying himself with these Old Testament saints in order to establish credibility with the Jewish critics that were plaguing the church. But if you are a child of God through the new birth, you are not your own. You have been bought with a price, and as God's bond slave, you are under orders to obey and to serve him alone. Paul is no longer a slave to himself, and neither are we. He is no longer a slave to the world and to the opinions of man. He is bound to God as his slave. We too have been redeemed from the slave market by the creator of the universe. So Christians are all slaves of God. As well, Jesus has given Paul the role of apostle or herald, a messenger. And his role is to further the faith of God's elect, to make it deeper, to make it a stronger faith. But not for everyone, though. Paul begins by stating the fact of God's election without apology or explanation. He assumes that both Titus and his mostly Gentile readers will understand and accept this truth that is repeated all through Scripture. Today, though, many Australian churches reject this clear but important truth that salvation is not rooted in your choice of God, but rather in his sovereign choice of you. It's usually explained away by saying that, well, God chose people for salvation because he foresaw that they would believe. But this would mean that God did not choose them, but rather they chose him. It also would mean that God is not sovereign in determining his plan for the ages, but rather he depended on man to decide and then he made up his plan around man. It really makes man sovereign, doesn't it? And God just agrees to whatever we decide to do. But the Bible is clear that God does not choose people for, sal for salvation because he foresees that they will believe. That would nullify his grace. It would take away his free gift because it would make salvation depend on something good in us. Rather, dead sinners that we are came to life and we believe because in his eternal purpose God chose or elected them for salvation. Although surrounded with mystery, the biblical teaching on election is for us. It's for Christian believers and it is intended as a practical truth because it assures faithful, struggling believers that their salvation is all of God from beginning to end and not of ourselves. As Phil said last week, far from giving us anything to boast about or to be arrogant about, this teaching of divine election firmly establishes a Christian's security. God has not left our assurance of salvation captive to our whims and changing feelings or faltering faith. Instead, the faithfulness of God demonstrated in his divine election gives us assurance of salvation because it doesn't depend on us. Paul's job that he passed on to Titus is to deepen the faith and increase the knowledge of the truth, truth with a capital T, because that will lead to godliness, so that Christians' hope in eternal life is as sure as the sun we see shining. You can see I wrote this before today. Because as I've already said, he is the God that cannot lie, and he promised this eternal life before the beginning of time. That's right, before the beginning of time as we know it anyway. Before he said, let there be light. Before he even created man, he already had our eternal lives in mind. The promise was there before there were any people that even needed it. That makes our hope of eternal life all the more secure, doesn't it? Biblical hope is not uncertain, such as we say, I hope the car will start, or again, I hope it will rain. Rather, biblical hope is absolutely certain, but not yet realised. The certainty rests on the character of the God who promises, the God who cannot lie. And that would have been a startling concept to a people that were notorious liars, that were known in society as liars. 
We don't know much about Titus himself other than he was a Gentile, not a Jew, and he was led to Christ by Paul. And the greeting at the start of the letter must have been a great encouragement to him and it can be to us as well. It shows the depth of deep friendship that they had. Titus, my true son in our common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Saviour. They had been friends for 20 to 25 years by this stage and we know that Titus was in Rome with Paul just before the time of Paul's death. We can tell that Titus was very astute and a very strong figure. In politics today, he might be referred to as a hatchet man or a strong man. Paul left him in Crete to put in order what was left unfinished. Crete was a tough place to be left to put things straight. We know that Corinth was no easy place to be a Christian either, let alone to be a leader and keep things in order. But Paul at one time urged Titus to go there as well, And another time Paul tells the Corinthians that Titus is coming to you with much enthusiasm and on his own initiative. And Paul reminds the Corinthians that when Titus came the first time, they received him with fear and trembling. Just before or just after Paul died, Titus went to evangelise Dalmatia, which is modern-day Serbia or Yugoslavia. Knowing the difficult situations in both Corinth and Crete, and his evangelism in Dalmatia, we can see that Titus was an insightful man who could handle problems with grace. Every one of us would do well to model Titus's commitment to truth, his passion in spreading the gospel, and his enthusiastic love for the church. These were young churches. They didn't have church buildings, and so they would have been house churches. We don't know how long Paul was there before he left, or how long it was before Paul sent this letter and indeed how long it took to get there. But what Titus was left there for was to bring order to the churches on Crete, starting with appointing an elder or an overseer to lead and guide them to further their faith and their knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness. The words translated here and elsewhere as elder, overseer and pastor or shepherd in Ephesians 4 are used interchangeably in the New Testament. Elder or presbyter indicates qualification, that is, maturity and experience, while overseer or episkopos, where we get our word bishop from, indicates responsibility, that is, watching over God's flock, leading them and protecting them from untruth. The word elder was adapted from the commonly used Jewish term for leadership. It referred to mature men who, because of their wisdom and experience, provided leadership in the various communities of Israel. In the same way as there are elders in Aboriginal communities in our own country. Applied to church leaders, elder emphasises the character of the man. He must be a spiritually mature man as reflected by consistent godly character. Our overseer comes from the secular Greek culture where it referred to those appointed by the emperor to lead captured or newly founded city-states. A bit closer to home, it was the term that was used in Jewish households in particular, larger Jewish households, where they would, he would, a father would appoint an overseer to run the household and he would appoint a man who had the qualities that he wanted his household to have. And in the same way, that's what Paul is getting Titus to do here. It looks at the function of the overseer, and that is to supervise, to watch over, to guard the local church, giving good teaching and refuting wrong teaching. Before we look at the list, I want you all to see that most of these qualities are listed elsewhere in the Bible for every believer. They describe a spiritually mature person. Paul speaks to every Christian when he tells Timothy to discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. There's a similar list in 1 Timothy 3, uh, written as well by Paul. The two lists are very similar. I don't know why they're not identical, and I haven't read anyone who sheds any light on that. I certainly don't think that the lists are meant to cover all the qualities that there are. A number of things in 1 Timothy aren't in Titus. 
a number of the things that Titus adds aren't in 1 Timothy. The most significant thing about both lists, though, is that except for the ability to teach God's word, both lists focus exclusively on godly character, not on spiritual gifts or other abilities or even what their role is. Both lists begin with above reproach and both lists emphasise a man's home life. The term above reproach is used in verse 6 and verse 7, first to sum up a man's home life and then to sum up his personal character. It means that there is nothing in the man's life for which a charge or accusation could be brought against him. He is a man of integrity. He doesn't live one way at church and another way at work or at home. His wife and children would affirm that he displays the fruit of the Spirit in the home. If he sins, he is quick to confess it and seek forgiveness. Verse 6, an elder must be a husband of one wife. Now this doesn't mean that he must be married. Otherwise Paul, probably Titus and Timothy and of course Jesus would never qualify. The term is literally a one woman man. And I think that that is looking at his character. He is devoted to his wife alone if he is married. He is devoted to Jesus if he is single. Married or single, he is not a womanizer like their hero Zeus. His thought life is under the control of God's spirit so that he is not enslaved to lust. He does not look at pornography. An elder should be a man who has a track record of being above reproach in mental and moral purity, an idea as countercultural today as it was 2,000 years ago. And he must have children that are under control. Once again, having children is not a requirement, but if he does, they must respect him and be in control. While the word there for believe is used elsewhere for Christian believers, Here it's more common usage of true or faithful fits better because no matter how good a father a man may be, he can't make his children Christians. That is the Holy Spirit's domain. But he must be in control of his household such that his children are true to him and to what he believes. The reason for this is given in Timothy and implied here. How can a man oversee a church if he can't control his own family? The home is the proving ground for the much larger task of managing a church. Um, At that time, the word children would have covered up to 12 or 13 years old when the Jewish boys uh, had their bar mitzvah. Uh, Today, it would refer up to about 17 or 18, uh, when children gain some measure of independence if they haven't already. After this, they would be called young men or young women, as as when Paul gives guidance for them in the next chapter. They are now more responsible for their own actions and reflect less on the head of the household. In my understanding, the text requires that we should look carefully at a man's relationship with his children. Does he model godly behaviour in the home? Is he conscientious to train his children in the ways of the Lord? Does he pray and read the Bible with his family? Paul's overall point is clear. An elder must be a godly husband and father. If his home life is not in order, don't expand his responsibilities over the family of God and expect him to perform there. A man who is not devoted to his wife and whose children are unruly and rebellious should not be put into church leadership. Paul goes on to list five negative character flaws that an elder must not have and then six positive qualities that he must have. An elder must not be overbearing. The word literally means self-pleasing. It refers to a man who obstinately maintains his own opinion or asserts his own rights and does not care about the rights, the feelings and the interests of anyone else. He never admits that he was wrong. He's not a team player. If he acts in such self-willed ways in the church or with other elders, you can assume that he runs his family like a drill sergeant. Don't make him an elder. An elder must not be quick-tempered. A quick-tempered man is always just a spark away from blowing up. He uses anger to intimidate or control others to get his own way. But James commands in chapter 1 
Let everyone be quick to hear, slow to speak and slow to anger. For the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. Patience, kindness and self-control are fruits of the Spirit that should govern a spiritually mature man. An elder must not be addicted to wine. The Bible does not prohibit drinking alcoholic beverages, but it does warn about the dangers of wine and strong drink, especially for leaders. Drunkenness and addiction to alcohol are always sinful. Church leaders must be especially careful so that they do not cause young believers to stumble. If someone who has or formerly had a problem with drinking sees me or Tim drinking, drinking freely, my example causes him to continue in or fall back into his former ways, then I am to some extent responsible. An elder must not be violent. While usually meaning physically hitting others, the word can refer to a man who is verbally combative. I shouldn't need to say that an elder should never strike anyone, especially his wife or children. The point is an elder should not be a man who solves conflict by hitting out at others or by being an aggressive bully. An elder must not pursue dishonest gain. In Timothy, Paul states that he must be free from the love of money. Money itself is not evil, but it is dangerous. It's a bit like a loaded gun. It can be very useful if used properly, but it can hurt others or yourself if used carelessly. A greedy man is not qualified to be an elder because greedy men are not godly. Greed is idolatry. Now some positive character qualities that an elder must have. An elder must be hospitable. The Greek word means literally a lover of strangers. Again, this is a quality that every Christian must strive for, but it is especially important for elders, for leaders in the church. If elders are not friendly and warm towards others, the entire church will reflect with indifference and selfishness. Hospitality means taking a genuine interest in others and making them feel welcomed and at ease. It should begin right here when the church gathers. If you are talking with someone you know and see a visitor all alone, don't keep talking to each other. Go to the visitor and make them feel welcomed. And of course, it doesn't finish after morning tea either. Open up your homes. Invite people in, especially people that you don't know. An elder must love what is good. Negatively, he doesn't fill his mind with all of the violent, sensual filth that is on TV, in movies and many computer games. Positively, as Paul puts it in Philippians 4, whatever is true, whatever is honourable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is in any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, Dwell on those things. An elder must be self-controlled, especially needed in Crete, but perhaps no less today. But Paul refers to it five times in the first two chapters. It means to be of sound mind, especially in the sense of not being impulsive. He is level-headed. He lives in light of his priorities and commitments. An elder must be upright or just. This word sometimes means righteousness, but in this context, it probably refers to a man who is fair and equitable in his dealings with others. He is not partial to the wealthy, nor does he ignore or belittle the poor and downtrodden. An elder must be holy. This refers to practical holiness, being separate from sin and evil behaviour. It does not mean being separate from sinners, because the Lord Jesus was the friend of sinners. But the man who is holy does not join with sinners in their sin. Instead, he tries to lead them to repentance. This man takes God and the word of God seriously. An elder must be disciplined. Paul uses this word in Corinthians to refer to an athlete who exercises self-control in all things so that he may win the prize. He doesn't do anything that would hinder him from his goal. 
An elder must have control over harmful desires or habits that would interfere with knowing Christ more deeply or with being an effective shepherd of his flock. He will be disciplined about spending time alone with God in the word and in prayer. Lastly, and perhaps most importantly, the overseer must not only know the trustworthy teachings as handed down to him from the apostles, whether personally or today by their writings. He must be able to teach them. In verse 9 it is called sound or healthy doctrine, not only because it builds up and makes for a stronger faith, but also because it protects from the corrupting influence of the world and its false teachers. You don't tell someone what a counterfeit note looks like. You make sure that they know what the real thing looks like so that they won't be fooled by a phony. Well, there you have it. We live in a world that is all about self, that wants nothing to do with the God who made it and instead sets up its own little gods. How do we live as God's holy people in such a hostile world? Well, the second half of verse 1. We need a knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness, an understanding that the only reason we know God is because of his grace and his choosing us from before time began and that we are saved to serve, doing good works that God has planned for us to do. If we can get those things and allow them to work their way through every part of our lives, then it will never be the world that is affecting us. It will be us that is affecting the world. In a properly functioning church, the overseer will teach the truth and guide the church towards godliness. That's why Paul gives this list to Titus at this time and why it's important for us today. Let's pray. Oh God, you are so good to us. We thank you for saving us. We thank you for teaching us. We thank you for revealing yourself, your son Jesus, to us. Lord, make us your children uh, in truth. Make us reflect the image that you would have us present of you, of your glory, of your love, your sacrifice, your forgiveness, your mercy for those around us um, and particularly those that we know who don't know you that we might, uh, by your power, lead them to you. Amen.